Donc, hi right, guys, it is a hot, sweltering midsummer day in mid October here in the shithole town of South Austin, Texas, here on our last sweltering day of summer 2018. That would be Sunday, October 14th, as old man winter barrels down. And I'm sitting here just trying to stay alive, pretty much. I think even the little dog is depressed. Uh, so anyway, being Sunday, it is time for my weekly doomsday sermon. Before I get into it, I just want to uh, plug uh, my little milk toast uh, twin over there on Collapse Chronicles. I just posted my interview uh, with Morris Berman, an hour-long interview with Morris Berman. So after this sermon, I suggest you go from sermon to Berman and you can check that interview out over on Collapse Chronicles. But we are going to hear from uh, a fellow who I've checked in with now every now and then, this fellow named Tom Murphy. And I need to get Tom on for an interview. He's got this blog called Do the Math. Do the Math using physics and estimation to assess energy, growth, and options. What are our options? Well, do the math and figure out what our options are. But anyway, well, I got a kick out of this. Uh, you know, I was just reporting uh, a minute ago that uh, we have just hit one as a planet 100 million barrels per day of uh, producing oil and other liquid fossil fuels it just happened we have now we are now pulling more of this shit out of the ground than any time in the history of humanity here in late 2018 so uh, I got a chuckle as I always do. Going back a few years, so we're going to go back seven years. Seven years when uh, Tom, uh, when brother uh, Tom Murphy is looking into the future, which would certainly include 2018. So this is the view from seven years ago, and uh, I'm I'm just going to let Tom take it away from here with his rant from seven years ago. The future needs an attitude adjustment. Kids these days, when I was a lad, tantrums were redressed with a spanking. Heck, spankings at school were answered by further spanking at home. In polite company, we might apply the euphemism attitude adjustment to make the unpleasant image of a bawling kid bent over the knee getting red in the tail. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to wade into the issue of whether or not such treatment is the most effective way to shape responsible adults, but I will say that I think our society needs some sort of attitude adjustment when it comes to expectations for our future. And then what I like about Tom is this guy, you know, I was wading through a few choices and so many times people get a little, a little flowery and, and pompous when they get behind a keyboard. Well, I like this guy. He speaks in nice little words that anyone can understand. <clears throat> People want stuff. There you go. People want stuff. This is how uh, he's boiling down the problem with the planet. <clears throat> Over the years, my diligent observation of people has led me to a deep inside deep insight. People want stuff. I know, bear with me, 
as I support my argument, Donald Trump, <laughs> you, you know, when this guy seven years ago was searching the planet for the poster child of the clueless fucking moron consumer that embodies every single thing that is wrong with planet Earth in the 21st century, he searched around the planet and came up with the one individual, if you, if you have to encapsulate the war against planet Earth in one individual in, in 2011, much less 2018, bear with me as I support my argument, Donald Trump. Okay, I think I've covered that. No, it's true. On the whole, we don't seem to be, be satiable creatures. Imagine the counterexamples. No thanks, boss. I really don't need a raise. About, I'm done with this money. Anybody want it? Where should I invest my money to guarantee 0% return? Well, I would suggest uh, real estate in the Catskill Mountains. Anyway, back to him. <clears throat> Answer anywhere lately, meaning talking about where to invest your money to make 0% return. I'm not saying that the world lacks generosity and charity. Huh. I'm not saying that it sounds... Anyway, I don't know what that sentence means in the middle of this rant. But how many examples do we have of someone making $500,000 a year in whatever form and donating $400,000 per year of it to those in need, figuring $100,000 a year is plenty to live comfortably? I want names and actually hope there are some examples well, I can give him an example of someone who used to make $100,000 a year and now makes $10,000 a year. But uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> the, this basic desire for more has meshed beautifully with a growth-based economic model and a planet offering up its stored resources. The last few hundred years is when things really broke loose. And it's not because we suddenly got smarter. Sure, we have a knack for accumulating knowledge, and there is a corresponding ratchet effect as we lock in new understanding. But we have the same biological brains that we did 10,000 years ago. So we haven't increased our mental horsepower. What happened is that our accumulation of knowledge allowed us to recognize the value of fossil fuels. Since then, we have been on a tear to develop as quickly as we might. It's worth, it, it's working. The average American is now responsible for 10 kilowatts of continuous power production, which is somewhat like having 100 energy slaves, humans being 100 watt machines. We are satisfying our innate need for more and more, and the availability of cheap, abundant, self-storing, energy-dense sources of energy have made it all possible. This is exactly describing the hundred million barrels a day that we are now pulling out of this planet and burning every single day, seven years after this was written. <clears throat> As we stand on the precipice of a transition away from this magic elixir, 
and I don't know where the bullshit detector button is. We are still heady with our sense of progress. We feel the wind in our hair and we know with certainty that the present would have been unimaginably rich and complex to someone living 200 years ago. <coughs> Humans, and especially Homo economicus, are ruthless extrapolators and we know with the same apparent certainty that the future will be as mind-bogglingly rich and complex and incomprehensible to us simpletons alive today. I get it. I admire the sentiment that we would be foolish to think we know where the far future leads. But, as I've already pointed out before, the same humility can be applied in the opposite direction. Who, in the year 2011, at the height of the fossil fuel binge, I would be curious to know uh, what the fossil fuel binge per day. My guess is in 2011, I'm just going to guess here, guys, probably somewhere in the 92 million to 94 million barrel per day uh, peak of the fossil fuel, uh, the height of the fossil fuel binge. We have not yet hit the height of the fossil fuel binge. We sure as shit weren't there seven years ago. Uh, could have possibly imagined that here we would sit in 2211 huddled around a fire sharing stories ever less believable of the days when we could walk on the moon. Hey, you gonna eat that last grasshopper? How many people are offended, scandalized, or just plain irritated by my suggestion that the future may be a step backward from where we are today. If you're one of these, then you are a candidate for an attitude adjustment. And there you go. The case for reversal. Okay. Bear in mind that I am no more qualified than any living person to know what the future will bring. But be very wary of anyone who expresses confidence about where we will be in 200, 100, or even 50 years from now. In truth, the future could be unrecognizably harder than today in as little as 20 years. To reject this real possibility is to be willfully biased toward a bright future. Just because I warn of a possible future of hardship does not mean that I totally reject the notion that we could pull through the transition ahead in glorious fashion to a splendid, shiny future for us all. In fact, I'd love to see that happen, and I would love it if we find a way around all my worries. But, given the scale of our challenges, we would be foolish to assume that this path will materialize. For me, the most compelling way to put the present era in perspective is to look at a cartoon plot of fossil fuel availability over the long term. And, and what this is, is he has a, a 10,000, no, I'm sorry, a 15,000 year uh, graph of, uh, of years. And, the, and of course, the, the fossil fuel, uh, his cartoon fossil fuel, is, looks like this. This plot snaps us out of the short-sightedness of our own lifetimes. 
that things are always growing and improving as we have always known them to be and highlights the utterly special nature of the here and now we learned from the Copernican Revolution that we should accept humility in assessing our place in the cosmos. We are not at the center of things the way we tend to think we are. Perhaps we have taken this lesson too much to heart because it makes it harder for us to appreciate that we actually are near the center of the fossil fuel curve, assuming that a high-tech future will naturally unfold on the back side of this curve is dangerous. If you are stuck in this mindset, I will give your backside something to think about. On a related note, the fossil fuel boom has brought with it the population boom, unprecedented resource exploitation, global warming, etc. Yet, humankind has always faced challenges, and we arguably have a good track record for coping with them if we exclude those moronic Romans, Mayans, Easter Islanders, etc. from our little club. Many are tempted to extrapolate past successes into a postulate that we will always innovate our way out of problems. The only thing that remains mysterious is just how we will manage that. But for us to pretend that we are not stressing the ecosystem on a multitude of fronts at a scale never seen before in this world is irresponsible. Hmm. It really is no wonder that we have a sense of unraveling. The future is unwritten and the recent past may not be a good template for the near future. We must accept that we f that we must accept that we face in the decline of fossil fuels the mother of all problems for humanity and that past success has been against the backdrop of cheap and abundant energy. An un familiar phase waits. Do you think so? Since the do the math post on peak oil, oh, I mean, see the do the math post on peak oil for particulars on one scenario that has me worried. In brief, a declining petroleum output leads to supply disruptions. And guys, I'm just going to interrupt here. Uh, he wrote this in 2011. I really want to uh, interview Tom and ask him about the fact that we are drilling, getting more oil than ever in 2018. But this whole argument uh, about the decline in fossil fuels is true whether it's uh, from peak oil or from peak global warming or whatever. Uh, it, the, one way or another, uh, the, the, the fossil fuel age is over. Uh, but anyway, see the do the math post on peak oil for particulars on one scenario that has me worried. In brief, a de declining petroleum output leads to supply disruptions in many commodities, price, price spikes, decline of the travel tourism industries, international withholding of oil supplies, possible resource wars, instability, uncertainty, a sea change in attitudes and hope for the future. 
loss of confidence in investment and growth in a contracting world, rampant unemployment, electric cars and other renewable dreams out of reach and silly sounding when keeping ourselves fed is more, pre is more pressing, an energy trap preventing us from large-scale, meaningful infrastructure replacement, etc. There can be positive developments as well, especially in demand and attitude adjustments. And perhaps the market offers more magic than my skeptical mind allows. But anyway you slice it, our transition away from fossil fuels will bring myriad challenges that will require more forethought, cooperation, and maturity than I see in headlines today. I wonder what he would say from today's Bloomberg headline, 100 million barrels the world has hit a daily oil and liquids record. I wonder what he would say uh, about the maturity for and forethought in that Bloomberg headline this Sunday morning. <clears throat> People often misinterpret my message that we, we risk collapse, believing me to say instead that we are going to collapse. They're obviously mixing up his message with Hambone Littletail's message because if, I don't think anybody is misinterpreting my message that we're fucked and we sure as hell are going to collapse. The sooner the better, but this is Tom's sermon, it's not mine. <clears throat> It's interesting to me that the concept of collapse is taboo to the point of coming across as an offensive slap in the face. It clearly touches an emotional nerve. I think we should try to understand that. Personally, this reaction scares me. It suggests an irrational faith that we cannot collapse. If I did not think the possibility for collapse was real, I might just find this reaction intellectually intriguing. But when the elements for collapse are in place, unprecedented stresses, energy challenges, resource limitations, overshoot of carrying capacity, the aversion to this possible fate leaves me wondering how we can mitigate a problem we cannot even look in the eye. Others react by an overuse of this word, just. We just need to get fusion working. We'll just paint Arizona with solar panels. We'll just switch to electric cars. We just need to go full-on nuclear, preferably with thorium reactors. We just need to exploit the oil shales in the Rocky Mountains. We just need to get those environmentalists off our backs so we can drill, baby, drill. This is the techno-fix approach. I am trying to chip away at this on do the math. The numbers often do not pan out, or the challenges are much bigger than people appreciate. I have looked for solutions to things we can just do to alleviate the pressures on the system, with the exception of just reducing how much we personally demand I have been disappointed again and again. <clears throat> I will come back to personal reduction in the months to come. Lots to say there. 
Another common reaction that I have heard myself is to get excited about a, about a technology that is not yet demonstrated, but seems awfully promising. Some refer to the effect as hopium, and yes, hopium is addictive. What I have found in myself is that the less I know about something, the more prone I am to the hopium effect. This is another part of human nature. I have noticed in my professional life that when multiple people are involved in the diagnosis of a complex problem involving many interacting components and subsystems to which each member has contributed some piece there is a tendency for each person to cast suspicion on the component they understand the least. Conversely, when looking for a solution, we give a pass to the concepts with fewer known demonstrated hang-ups. It may well be that our energy resource salvation lies in some presently obscure or unappreciated technique, but realizing that obsession with these notions means bypa bypassing tried and true conventional technologies like solar panels, solar thermal, wind, hydroelectric, geothermal, conventional fission, lead acid storage, etc. to me is a tacit acknowledge that the main ideas we have on the table are not obviously going to cut it. Such enthusiasm for the unproven, often accompanied by statements of unmitigated hope, our best hope, the only real solution, we must aggressively develop, etc., carries with it a ring of desperation. And now, of course, can you say uh, geoengineering and carbon capture and removal is uh, obviously the, the newest one. Uh, this hopium bullshit uh, carrying the ring of desperation. The trick is to remain attentive to the real potential under the shrill sound of fantastic thinking in case salvation actually does lie within. Uh, but anyway, guys, I can see this uh, sermon is going on a lot longer than I realized. I will put the, uh, the, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to put the, uh, the link to the rest of this essay, I strongly uh, advise you to read this whole thing and check out Tom's uh, and Tom's website. From here, he goes on to our addiction to growth. Uh, obviously, and then where are the adults looks into that. Uh, okay, well let's uh, let's get to the end of Tom's sermon to wrap this up. My basic point in all of this is that I perceive fundamental human weaknesses that circumvent our making rational, smart adult decisions about our future. Our expectations tend to be outsized with respect to the physical limitations at hand. We quickly dash up against ideological articles of faith so that many of us are unable to acknowledge that there is an energy or resource problem at all. 
the Dr. Spock in me wants to raise an eyebrow and say, fascinating. The human in me is distressed by the implications to our collective rationality. The adult in me wants less whining, fewer temper tantrums, realistic expectations, a willingness to sacrifice where needed, the maturity to talk of the possibility of collapse, and the need to step off the growth train and adoption of a selfless attitude that we owe future generations, a livable world where we can live rich and fulfilling lives with another click of the ratchet. Otherwise, we deserve a spanking, sorry, an attitude adjustment. And if we don't, nature is happy to oblige. And that is exactly what we're waiting for is our long overdue spanking from uh, Mother Nature and uh, don't worry, Mama Nature is, is getting out her paddle board and we're going to be thrown over the knee of Mother Nature and our collective backsides are going to get a weapon. But anyway, we will try to line up an interview with Brother Tom to see if his uh, opinions of collapse are stronger than they were, impending collapse were stronger than they were seven years ago. And I'm going to take a wild guess that they are. But I'm going to wrap up uh, today's doomsday sermon and figure out what to do with the last summer afternoon in the shithole city of Austin, Texas. Smoke them if you got them, guys. We all know why. Bye, guys.